again and have the opportunity to worship um, this morning and um, hopefully learn a little something too. So yes, very good and happy Thanksgiving um, week to all of you. First of all, I want to uh, give a shout out and a thank you to everyone who helped yesterday uh, raking leaves. Um, I'm ashamed to admit I'm a little sore, but um, um, that's okay. Um, it was great. Um, definitely time better spent than watching the Huskers. So uh, <laughs> all of those of you that chose to do that, you now regret it. No. Um, but yeah, we, we, we got a lot accomplished, and it is always good to get together and work for a common cause. So thank you to everyone um, who helped with that. Uh, if you will, pull out your bulletins. Um, several announcements that I want to highlight, make sure um, you're aware of. Um, first of all, um, today we will be welcoming some new members. That's so exciting, um, and so that'll be a part of our service a little bit later on. I won't say too much more about that now, but we are excited and thankful for that opportunity today, and also for the opportunity to take a meal to the rescue mission. Um, thank you, Brian and Debbie, for taking that down, and um, we're so thankful for the great ministry that they do. Um, I know their regular uh, dinner got canceled, but they've been doing an online auction um, for to still raise money for the mission, so um, if you're interested in doing any Christmas shopping there, I don't know if it's closed yet or not, but we're thankful for the rescue mission and the good gospel-centered work they continue to do. Um, this Wednesday night, Thanksgiving Eve service, no, none of our regular Awana or High League or Bible studies, um, but we will have a service here at 7 p.m., our Thanksgiving Eve service. Um, we hope you will be a part of that for those of you watching online or if you're traveling and can't make it, but you can get by a computer Wednesday night, you can, uh, we'll plan to live stream that as well. So that's at 7. We will still have a pie fellowship after. For those interested, bring a pie to share. Um, and yeah, that'll be a good time. And then we'll do a little decorating for Christmas following that as well. So that'll all take place um, Wednesday evening, starting with service at 7 o'clock. As part of that, um, any of you ladies who would like to sing for a special music for that, um, tonight at 8 p.m., right here at the piano, they're going to be practicing that song. So any ladies interested in singing on Thanksgiving Eve, um, hopefully you've let Carla know, or even if you haven't, if you show up at 8, they'll include you. Um, 8 tonight to practice for that. Um, and then also as a part of this week of Thanksgiving, we take an offering for Covenant World Relief. Um, this is our denominations, one of our main mission outreach organizations, support um, a lot of missionaries and, and works all around the country through Covenant World Relief. And so we take an offering for specifically for them once a year. Um, and the way we're doing that this year is just mark, if you're doing a check, just write it in the memo. If you have cash, that you want to give or coins there's envelopes by the giving box so just make sure you put it in one of those envelopes so it doesn't get in with the general but you can do that today wednesday night or next sunday um, any of that time if you would like to give a gift to covenant world relief um, on that note i just want to say thank you guys um, last week we had jordan and trisha schlake here um, and we did a retiring offering, and just a few weeks before that, we had um, Pasquale here from Rio Grande and did a retiring offering there, too. And you, you all are so generous and so kind, and just thank you. Um, I know those gifts mean so much and um, are a blessing, and um, I, I get the joy of being the one to contact them and let them know we're, we're giving them the gift, so I want to pass along that joy to you all, but thank you for um, your your continued faithfulness with the tithe and then also for going above and beyond um, for these missions. It's just such a blessing um, to see all of your generosity. So thank you um, very much for that um, as well. Um, you will notice on the back of the bulletin at the very bottom, Florence um, Eldorado, she is staying in Lincoln at the same um, facility she's been at, but she was moved to a new room. So has a new room number, new phone number. Um, and so if you would like to send her a card, a note, a letter, um, I just want to challenge our whole church family. Um, I know this is me and the deacon's primary responsibility, but let's all at least call one person from our church or, or send a letter this week, a card, to one person that you know that is in a care facility or, um, or, or 
stuck at home. Um, obviously, holidays, that's a tough time to be not able to be with families. And I know all of us are having to make some of those tough decisions this year. But, um, or maybe it, it's a nurse or a doctor you know, and you can write them a letter of an encouragement. But um, let's all do that, well, at least one this week. Either make a call or write a card to somebody. I just thought of that, um, but I thought I'd challenge all of us to, to do that um, this week as well. And then um, a few inserts. You'll see some missions updates, an update from, um, from Glad Tidings Bible Camp to know um, some of the blessings that have come this year and how to be praying um, there, an update um, from one of our missionaries that you can read and know how to be praying. So um, please read those as well. And then also some additional announcements. Um, newsletter information for December is due to Betty by Tuesday of this week. Um, so, um, yeah, with the holiday, it's coming quick. But if you have anything for the December newsletter, please get it to Betty this week. Um, our annual meeting is coming December 13th, um, so three weeks away. We're doing it a little different this year, um, so that is all members who would like can be involved, the an and um, we're not having a potluck. So the annual meeting will be at 915 during Sunday school. There will not be Sunday school that day, um, but we'll have our annual meeting here in the sanctuary. That way, those who come to the early service can stay, and you guys can just come, and then we don't have to stay after church and have grumbling stomachs. Um, so, so that'll be December 13th at 9.15 here in the sanctuary, and we are going to ask everyone to wear a mask for that so that everyone who is a member will feel um, like they can be a part of that. We want those at the early service to know that um, their, their thoughts are important. So um, that'll be December 13th, 915. One of the biggest things um, on the docket for that is um, our kitchen remodel project. There's been much work going into that from, from um, the kitchen committee and Mike, and so um, that'll be one of the biggest things. And so what we're going to do with that is on December 6th, which is the previous Sunday, our kitchen committee will give an update on that Sunday in both services, letting you know um, the scope of the project, letting you know they have gotten bids, so they, the pricing, um, and then you will have that week then to ask any questions you may have, to pray about it, and then on December 13th at the annual meeting, we'll take a vote. Okay, so December 6th, we will... Um, hear about the project. You can ask any questions and pray throughout that week, and then we will have a vote on December 13th. Sound good, Steve? Okay, um, very good on that. And then along with that annual meeting, you'll see annual reports and financial reports um, are due and um, to Betty by December 1st. Um, and, and, well, the financial reports need to go to uh, Rowan and Rod, um, as well as a summary report to Betty. But see those announcements, those of you that need to get annual reports and financial reports in for that as well. Um, we want to make sure to do that. And then also a note of thanks in here. Um, if you weren't aware, Brian and Debbie came to Awana on Veterans Day. Veterans Day fell on a Wednesday. And so we had them come and they shared um, an awesome uh, lesson. I heard the kids loved it. Um, on our country and um, the flag and folding the flag. So Brian and Debbie, thank you for coming and doing that. And then also this week we had our Awana Derby, um, and Brian and Debbie helped secure the racetrack for that as well. So I heard that was a lot of fun and went really well. So um, thank you to everyone that helped with that, and thanks to Brian and Debbie for um, helping with that as well. Um, and finally, Blood Drive um, at the Wassa Fire Hall on Friday. Um, huh? Does how much you eat impact your ability to give blood? <laughs> um, you can get full of food on Thursday and then lose some blood on Friday. Okay, that's <laughs> kind of how, how it goes, I guess. So anyway, um, awesome opportunity um, to be able to donate blood um, on Friday at the fire hall from one to six. Um, you can call. There's a number to call for an appointment uh, for that. So a lot of things um, upcoming. Uh, anybody else have any other announcements? Anything? Okay. Um, well, let me open in prayer, and then we are going to um, worship together. So 
Uh, yeah, let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you so much um, for your goodness to us, for your love for us, and for this opportunity to gather together um, and, and lift up our voices to you in praise and, and worship you and um, hopefully learn something from your word. And God, I'm just so thankful that we can be together and that you are here with us. Um, you will meet us here uh, this morning. Um, and so we just want to um, turn our focus, our attention, our praise to you, God. I know there's so many distractions. This is a busy time of year, but I pray for this short time that we are together that we would just lay those aside and, and be able to focus on you and, and on worshiping you for who you are and, and for what you have done and are currently doing in our lives and in the world around us, God. We are just so very thankful for the opportunity to know you and to worship you. It's in the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Come, worship team, um, and let's prepare to worship together. Have you heard the good news? Everything's going to be all right. It's all going to work out. It says so right here in the Bible. I saw this verse here. It says this. And, and you know, listen to the very definitive words in this verse. It says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. It's all going to work out. Well, I guess you need to clarify. It says, for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is our hope. We don't have to worry. Let's stand up and worship. <laughs> the nations Jesus comfort for all who mourn you are the source of heaven's hope on earth Jesus light in the darkness Jesus truth in each circumstance you are the source of heaven's light on earth in history broke the chains, you rose to life. You are the hope living in us. You are the rock in whom we trust. You are the light shining for all the world to see. You rose from the dead, conquering fear. Our Prince of Peace drawing us near. Jesus, our hope, living for all who will receive. Lord, we believe. Jesus, hope of the nations. Jesus, comfort for all who mourn. You are the source of heaven's hope. truth in each circumstance. You are the source of heaven's light on earth. In history, you lived and died. You broke the chains. You rose to light. And you are the hope living in us. You are the rock in whom we trust. You are the light shining for all the world to see. You rose from the dead, 
conquering fear, our Prince of Peace, drawing us near, Jesus our hope, living for all who will receive. You rose from the dead, conquering fear, our Prince of Peace, drawing us near, Jesus our hope, living for all who will receive. Lord, we believe. Lord, we believe. Lord, we believe. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when My all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith. This gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid Death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood. Commands my destiny. No power of hell, no schemes of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. More in the power of Christ I'll stand. No power of
enfold you with his spirit and his love. Let him fill your heart and satisfy your soul. Oh, let him have those things that hold you and his spirit like a dove will descend upon your life and make you whole. Jesus, oh Jesus, come Amen. Oh, it's good to worship. It's good to worship, church family. Um, hey, I am so excited, honestly. Um, this is, I know this has been a tough year, but this is really exciting for me and for us as a church this morning. Uh, this morning, we have the opportunity to, to welcome uh, four new members into our church family. And so right now, I would like to invite um, Devin and Leanna Munter and Abby Banks and Audrey McRae to come join me um, here on the stage. Um, all four of these individuals have attended our membership class. Um, they have confessed their faith in Jesus Christ. They have been baptized, and they have been affirmed enthusiastically and unanimously um, by our church board for membership. And so I'd like to start by just reading 
uh, a couple scripture passages. Um, and really, there are so many scriptures that talk about um, unity in, in the body of Christ, and so many. But I picked a couple from the book of Romans. Um, so first, listen as I read from Romans chapter 12, verses 10 through 12. It says, Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. Never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. And then over three chapters in Romans 15, 5 through 7, Paul writes, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ has accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Um, and I'm so excited um, to add these four individuals. You know, um, sometimes in church how it kind of goes is somebody starts coming and then they go to membership and then they become members and then you kind of encourage them to get involved. Um, but what's cool about all the four of these individuals is they're already involved. They're already all serving and, and ministering and being a blessing to our church family. Um, and obviously, membership is not required for that. Um, and so I'm just thankful um, for, for this commitment they're making, but, but more so, I'm just thankful for the blessing that all four of them already are to, to our church family um, serving in, in various capacities in various ways. So um, Devin and Leanna and, and Abby and Audrey, um, I want each of you to know that we are thankful for you. Uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ, he has made you part of his universal church at the point of salvation, which you have all um, confessed, and, and now he has led you to unite with our local church body here. And, and so now I'm going to ask you guys to answer these questions in order to affirm your faith in the presence of God and your brothers and sisters here today. So first, to the four of you, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and promise to follow him as your Lord? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the Holy Scriptures, the Old and New Testament, as the Word of God in the only perfect rule of faith, doctrine, and conduct? If so, say, I do. Finally, do you intend to live among God's people in this church family, to hear God's Word and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth? If so, say, I do. Awesome. Now, members of this congregation, I just have one question for you. Do you, as a church family, receive these believers into your fellowship and care? If so, answer, we do. We do. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Hey, I just want to um, pray for these four individuals, and, and we're not going to gather around them and, and, and all pray. We're, we're just going to pray from our seats. Um, so if, if you'll join me in this prayer, and you can pray while I'm praying as well, that would be awesome. But we're going to pray um, for these four individuals. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, God, we are so thankful, first of all, for your plan of salvation. Um, God, we needed that, God. And, and, and you had a perfect plan um, when, when we messed up in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve um, rebelled against you and sin um, came into our lives and now we're born with the sin nature and we know that separates us from a perfect God but you had a plan you had a way to redeem us to restore us through Jesus Christ our, our Lord and Savior God and so I, I'm just so thankful God um, for that plan of salvation and then also I'm thankful for your church God um, that you are building here, here in our community and all over the world, as we heard from Jordan last week, God. And, and we're thankful that we get to be a part of that, God. 
Uh, we get to be a part of building your church, of, of expanding your kingdom, of shining your light in our community and around our world. And I thank you for these four individuals, for Devin and Leanna and Abby and Audrey, who, who desire to do that and, and who are already um, doing that in so many ways. God, I just pray that, that you, your hand of blessing would be on these four individuals, that you would continue to show them how you have gifted them um, for ministry, uh, both in our church family and um, in their own families and in our community and, and beyond, God. I just pray that you would continue to reveal to them um, how you've gifted them for ministry and how you want to use them and your plan for each and each one of their lives, God. God, I thank you for the blessing and encouragement that each one of them um, have already been to me and, and to our church family. Dear God, I pray that we would be able to reciprocate that blessing back to them as well. And so as they take um, th this step and make this commitment to our church family, God, I just pray that you would bless them. Um, that, that your hand of, of blessing and guidance and provision would be on each one of them and on each one of their families, dear God. Thank you for this joyous um, occasion, this joyous opportunity. We want to give you all the glory and, and all the praise. And it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's give him a hand, and you guys, we're done. You can head back to your seats. So, very good. Very good, very good. So, yes, that is awesome, um, and it is um, a joy to, um, to add to our membership. And I just remind you, you know, what is God doing right now? He is building His church, um, and, and the fact that we get to be a part of that with how sinful and fallen we are. Um, we still get to be a part of that, and, and God um, wants to use us. And so I'm thankful for each and every one of you who, who serve in various ways. Um, it's, it's so important to this church family. The church needs every part of us. We may have just added an arm and an ear and a foot. I don't know, but it's the body of Christ, right? In the body of Christ, we all need each other. So, um, yes, thank you, thank you. Joe, come read our scripture this morning. <laughs> Fanfare. Our scripture is from uh, James 3, 1 through 12. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow, flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Very good. Um, so yes, after last week, um, taking a break from James and hearing from 
uh, the Slakes. I hope you were blessed um, being able to hear from the Slakes. It's always good to hear about how God is at work all over the world. Um, you know, I am always encouraged. And so I hope you were blessed by, by that as well. But today we are back in James um, for one week. And actually, believe it or not, next week is the first Sunday of Advent. Um, and so here comes Christmas. And so we're actually going to take a break from James during December and, and focus on Advent in the Christmas season. And then we will come finish the book um, in January. Um, but before we get into today's text, I just want to quickly recap what we've covered so far in this um, awesome book of James. There is so much here. First of all, uh, we know that this book was written, or we're pretty sure, we're actually... We're pretty sure this book was written by James, the half-brother of Jesus. Um, and, and you may know this or you may not, but James actually didn't grow up thinking that Jesus was the Savior, that he was the Christ. Now, I feel like we have to cut James a little bit of slack here. Um, thinking that your brother is the Savior of the world would be hard for any of us to do. And so um, James kind of struggled in that area, but um, after Christ crucifixion and, and resurrection and after James saw his resurrected body he his life was changed just like the apostle Paul he became on fire um, for for God and, and for Christ and, and he soon began leading uh, one of the ch largest church movements in in Jerusalem and then he wrote us this book of James and he didn't write it to one specific audience uh, like we see Paul do, you know, Paul wrote to the Ephesians or to the Romans or to the Corinthians. He didn't write to one specific audience, and he didn't write for one specific reason. Rather, he is just writing to all believers scattered abroad and just passing along the wisdom that he has gained, that he has possessed. And there is so much wisdom um, found in this letter. And so in chapter 1, um, after his greeting, it starts with this very odd statement. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you go through trials. At first glance, we hear that and we think, what? You know, that doesn't make any sense. Why, why would I have joy in trials? It's not that trials are joyful or that we look forward to them, but we can have joy in trials because when we go through a trial in life, and we lean on God, and we trust God even more, and God sees us through that trial, guess what? It makes our faith stronger. We develop a more persevering, a more enduring faith. And I know even this year, many have gone through so many trials. And I just want to tell you, if you lean into God and trust Him through those trials, and He sees you through, which He will, He's promised us He will, when you come out on that other side, you will have a stronger faith. And that's why we have joy um, in, the, in the trials of life. And then uh, later in chapter 1, He talked about um, temptation, not giving in to temptation. And temptation in life comes because we all have desires. We all have desires in life. Um, and desires in and of themselves are not bad. But the question with our desires in life is, am I going to try to fulfill my desires my own way, doing things my way, what I think is best, or the way of the world? Or am I going to follow God's way to fulfill my desires? If I try to do it my own way, that's what giving in to temptation is. When I choose to do it God's way, it honors him. And um, as it says there in verse 1, when we learn that every good and perfect gift comes from above, comes from God, then we're more likely to do things his way and not give in to temptation. Um, and then at the end of chapter 1, we're warned about just being listeners of the word of God versus actually doing what it says. It is so easy to, to read the Bible or to hear the Bible taught and just let it come in one ear and out the other, but it never really changes our lives. It is much harder to actually apply it, to actually become a doer of the word, to actually do what it says. But that is the challenge that James gave us at the end of chapter one. Then in chapter two, um, we learn about, um, we're warned not to adopt the value system of the world. 
Okay, a value system that's all about external appearance and comparison and showing favoritism and partiality to some people over others. But rather, we are to conduct ourselves by God's value system, which is a value system of grace, a value system that sees all humans as created equal. And, and, and finally, a couple weeks ago, we discussed the role of works in a faith that saves how we are not saved by our works, but true saving faith will always show itself through works. When you really understand that, that, that I am a sinner and that sin separates me from God and I could never make my way to God on my own, but he sent his son to this earth to die for my sins and gave me his righteousness in its place. When you really understand that and you accept that gift works will be the result they will come after that and that was the end of chapter two and this brings us to chapter three where we'll be starting today but before i get to that um i want to remind us of something you know way back in genesis chapter one when god created the world we learned probably the most beautiful truth about ourselves as human beings which is that we are made in the image of of God. We are made in the image of God. And, and being God's image bearers has a lot of beautiful connotations to it. But one of the most compelling is that as God's image bearers, we have the opportunity and the obligation to rule over all of creation. What one way we see this play out is that we as humans have the ability to train animals you know th this is something that no other living creature has the ability to do and something that i would say would be hard for an evolutionist to explain okay if, if we are just more evolved apes or or monkeys then why do we have the ability to train other animals okay i've never seen a monkey train a horse Okay, um, I would like to ask that question to, a, to, a, to an evolutionist. Why do we as humans have the ability to train other living things? Um, I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to go to this place um, here, um, to go to SeaWorld, or maybe you've seen pictures or videos of SeaWorld. I had the opportunity once, a lot of fun. Um, but at SeaWorld, we see how these huge animals, like, like killer whales, Okay, now they give them cute names like Shamu, but um, they, are, they are huge killer whales, can be trained to swim certain ways, to, to move its tail, to splash the crowds, to jump out of the water, to even get up on a platform at the front of the water and kind of pose for the crowd. And this is absolutely amazing that killer whales can be trained by humans to do this. And you know, it's obviously not by force, that they're trained to do this. <laughs> a whale is way bigger than its trainer. Um, rather, it is our human intellect and, and positive reinforcement and, and rewards that the, that the SeaWorld trainers use. Very similar methods that you may have used to train a dog or, or a horse or, or even in a circus, you know, how they train a tiger. However, in today's text, we find James saying that there is one amazingly powerful thing that no human can tame. And sadly, this thing has a greater impact on all of our lives and is more likely to destroy us than any other creature or living thing. And, and I'm just going to tell you right up front this morning, for, for me, today's text feels kind of like a gut punch. Okay, it hits me hard. You, you see, when I get up here to preach, I, I don't do so as someone who has everything figured out. Qu quite often, when I get up here, I am preaching to myself, and you all just happen to be out here listening, okay? Um, I am actually preaching to myself, and that is so true with today's text. Quite honestly, this is a text that I would rather just skip over. Because it brings a lot of conviction. 
But, but it is so very important for our Christian walk, and we can't skip over it as we shouldn't skip over any part of Scripture, no matter how difficult or challenging it may be. And, and, and so I want us to try to view um, our text this morning as if there wasn't a chapter break from the end of chapter 2 to the beginning of chapter 3. As you may know, the writers of Scripture did not write in chapters and verses. Okay, if you've ever written a letter, this is a letter. If you've ever written a letter, I doubt when you write that letter, you've said chapter 1, verse 3. And, you know, that's not how we write letters. That's not how they wrote letters either in the Bible time. We put in chapters and verses later so that we can quickly find different parts of Scripture. And that's a good thing, you know. Instead of just saying about halfway through the book of James, it says, you know, I can say James 3, chapter 1. But, unfortunately, I think sometimes chapters have a negative impact on us because, like chapter books, we think, okay, that's the end of that part, and now we're starting a new part. But that's, James is not doing that here. And so I want us to try to imagine that there's not um, a chapter break. Just like James was saying at the end of chapter 2, how saving faith always produces works or fruit in our lives, one of those fruits should definitely be what comes out of my mouth. If you're familiar with the fruit of the Spirit, you know the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And what's the last one? Self-control. Who? Okay, self-control. I think that has a lot to do with what comes out of our mouth, with what we communicate. And I'm going to try to show us today how really self-control should really be called God-control. Because that's, really, um, that's really what it means. And so with this in mind, let's pick up in, in James chapter 3, verse 1. Verse 1 says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. All right, this is a very humbling opening verse, especially for someone who is a teacher of scripture like myself but but in this verse james is not just talking to the pastor okay he is talking to anyone who teaches the word of god in any setting anyone who who says the bible says and then goes on to interpret scripture when you do this you are speaking for god to the audience that god has entrusted to you and that is a very serious matter. Now, I should mention that word judged at the end of verse 1 is not just a negative word. Okay, when we think of judgment, usually it has a negative connotation to it. But that Greek word actually was a neutral word. So it could mean positive judgment or it could mean negative judgment, either one. And if we look at the context of this verse, it would appear that many of these new Christ followers were, were assuming the role of teaching and interpreting Scripture, and, and James was kind of warning them that not just anybody should be doing this, because teaching God's Word is a very serious matter. You see, these new uh, Christ followers, most of them had previously, that they had grown up Jews, right? And, and in the Jewish, as Jews, they had Pharisees and Sadducees who, who were the teachers, but now they were Christ followers, and obviously not very many Pharisees or Sadducees became Christ followers. They didn't think he was the Savior. So now it was kind of like, well, who's going to teach now? Well, I guess I will. Well, I guess I will. And everybody was wanting to give their input. And James is kind of saying, whoa, not just anybody should be a teacher. He's kind of warning them um, against that. You know, I have great confidence in, in every one of our Sunday school teachers and, and Awana leaders and, and Bible study leaders here at our church. I have great confidence that every one of them is approaching God's word diligently and, and with a great deal of seriousness and respect. Uh, if that wasn't the case, we wouldn't have them serving in, in that capacity, not only for the sake of the church, but really for their own sake. Um, as well. And, and James is warning here that if you intentionally misrepresent Scripture for your own motives or your own gain, or even 
Maybe it's not intentional, but even if you're just careless with how you approach the teaching of Scripture, that is a very serious matter. Okay, any time that you or I are speaking for God, any time that we are talking theology or doctrine or what the Bible says, we will be held accountable before God for what we say. Because really what we are doing is we are quoting God. And it is a very serious thing to misquote God. You know, I remember the first time that I ever got up to preach the word of God behind a pulpit in a church setting. Um, it was the summer of 2014. I was 24 years old. Our church was doing a series, actually, on the fruit of the Spirit. And on July 6th, I preached the message titled, The Power of Patience. I don't think I'll ever forget that message. I remember I found out from our senior pastor that I would be preaching um, on that day and on that topic sometime towards the end of May. And I started working on that message right away. So I spent six weeks working on that one message. I probably had six or eight drafts of the message. I, I practiced it out loud like 10 or 12 times. I had my wife and three or four other pastors look over it. I probably honestly spent over 100 hours working on that, that one message, kind of because I was nervous. I was very nervous, but also because I knew James 3 verse 1 and and I knew this was something preaching God's word was something that that I needed to take very seriously and, and just a funny side note but I was so nervous that day and that church had a YouTube channel like ours did so I went back and watched it and when I went back and watched it I was so nervous the whole time I did not stand still I did this the whole message I kid you not um, and, and I'll go back and watch it now And I'm like Lane stand still But the whole message I was doing this And maybe I stood here for a second But I, yeah I was nervous And so please don't go watch that message Unless I guess if you need a laugh You can try to go find it But yeah I was just back and forth the whole time um, So anyway um, You know Even to this day I take this calling, especially this task, or, or really this opportunity, very seriously. You know, some of you might not realize this. Um, I think Linnell knows this since her dad was a pastor, but almost every Sunday afternoon, I go home and I take a nap <laughs> because I am just spent on Sunday afternoons. And, and at first glance, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, I get here, you know, maybe 7.30. I'm home by 12.30. That's like five hours. You know, if you want to call it a work day, I don't consider it a work day. I, I love, love, this is my favorite day of the week. But I, I know many of you regularly work 10, 12-hour days. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But it's not so much that I'm physically spent as I am just emotionally and uh, intellectually and spiritually drained on Sunday afternoons. And that is partially in large part because i take this opportunity very seriously and i know that i will be judged more strictly for for what i share for for how i handle the word of god and, and i hope that this is true to some degree for each and every one of you who teach god's word in some form to another even if it's just to your kids or to your grandkids that that is still teaching the word of God. Uh, let's keep going. Verse 2. Verse 2 says, We all stumble in many ways. Amen. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect and able to keep their whole body in check. You know, this is a very interesting statement of James. Um, first of all, that word stumble is just another word for sin. Okay, so James is pointing out our humanity. We all sin. We all struggle. We all fall short of God's perfection, of his standards. We all stumble. But, but then James basically goes on to say that what comes out of your mouth, what you say, is kind of a gauge by which you can measure your life. Okay, he says that if you can get control of what you say, you can control every other aspect of your body. But on the flip side, if your mouth is out of control, then you're probably out of control. Our mouth is a great gauge by which to measure our spiritual growth. 
And the reason for this, James will explain later, is because none of us can control our own tongue. So we need the Holy Spirit to step in and take control. So so in essence, if the Holy Spirit has control of my mouth, of my communication, there's probably a good chance that he also has control of the rest of me, and, and I will be growing spiritually. But if my mouth and what I communicate is out of control, that's kind of a sign that the Holy Spirit probably doesn't have much control in other areas of my life either. Okay, then James, again, gives a couple um, illustrations. I I love James's illustrations. They're all over this letter. Uh, Verse 3, he says, When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal with just a little bit. Um, in the rains or take ships as an example although they are so large and are driven by the winds they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants them to go so we have this this little bit in a horse's mouth that controls the whole large animal or this small rudder on a ship that controls the whole ship And, and obviously he's comparing the bit in the rudder to our tongue Even though our tongue is a very small part of our body, it can control the whole direction of our lives. In fact, look at what James says in verse 5, followed by one more illustration. He says, Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. That that word boasts here is a negative term, referring to our pride or our selfishness. Then he says, Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. You know, it appears that just like we saw with showing favoritism a couple weeks ago, these new believers James was writing to were trying to downplay the importance of the tongue or of our speech or of our communication. And we do this same thing today. You all are familiar with the saying, sticks and stones may break my bones. How does it end? But words will never hurt me, right? I'd like to tell you nothing could be further from the truth. Okay, but, but we live that way. We say things like, well, I was just joking. Well, well, I didn't really mean it. Or it was just a small lie. And, and on and on we go. But James is refuting this now by comparing the tongue to a forest fire or a small part spark that causes a forest par- fire. You know, I know this is a very real analogy, as even just this fall, we've seen or heard about many huge, devastating fires in Colorado and California and Washington and other areas. And it's amazing because these huge fires are not usually started with some, by somebody with a blowtorch in a tank of gasoline trying to cause a huge fire. No, they are often started by a small campfire that didn't quite get put out or or a cigarette that was tossed into the dry woods. In in, in fact, I don't know if you saw this story um, this fall, but one of the wildfires in Southern California was actually started this fall by a gender reveal party. Okay, I don't know if some of you even know what this is. Um, a gender reveal party, I think my generation started it, and, and it's where you throw this huge party just to find out if you're having a boy or a girl. And you do all these crazy things. Um, I'm not crazy about them. Not one of the proudest moments for our generation. But anyway, this family was having a gender reveal party, and they were going to light off some fireworks. And I guess if the fireworks were pink, they were having a girl. If it was blue, they were having a boy. Well, some of the fireworks misfired, started a spark that started a fire that ended up burning thousands of acres of land in Southern California. And I don't say this to make light of an obviously devastating situation where many people lost their homes and some may have even lost their lives. But, but I say this to help us see that the point that James is making. You see, usually it's not that we have these preconceived, horrible things that we plan to say to someone in order to ruin their life. And, and we write it out and we practice what we're going to say and we rehearse it. And we just want to say horrible things to ruin their life and, and ruin our testimony. No, no, usually it's the small 
It's the spark. It's the small statements when we're not paying attention, when, when we're not being careful, when, when we haven't given God control. And, and I should mention here that it's not just our tongue, what we, what we say with our mouth anymore. It's any way we communicate. It's our text. It's our email. It's our, our Twitter, our Facebook, our Snapchat. Any way that we communicate. A small spark can start a huge forest fire. And, and you know, I believe in the church, we still to this day tend to downplay certain sin issues and put a lot of focus on others. Okay, it, it, when there's someone struggling with, with alcoholism or, or adultery, you know, that's a huge issue. And, I, and I'm not saying that it's not, but if there's someone who, who just kind of likes to gossip, or, or they, they tear other people down, well, that, that's not that big a deal. That's just kind of how that person is. You know, but James is, that's not what James says here. He's saying all sin is a huge deal to God. And issues of the tongue or our communication are a huge problem. Just look at the intensity of the language James uses in the next verse. Look at verse 6. He says, the tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Wow. That's pretty strong, isn't it? First of all, what does James mean when he says a world of evil? Um, the best way I've heard this described is that the, the sum total of all of our sin will make its way to your mouth, and, and out it will come. Um, in, in other words, whatever you or I are struggling with, if it's arrogance or pride or anger or bitterness or fear or unforgiveness or lust or whatever else that we're dealing with, it makes its way to our mouth, and out it comes. Jesus himself said it this way in Luke 6, 45. He said, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. I, I, the way I learned it, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And this is why it is such a huge deal. And James goes on to say in the rest of verse 6 that an untamed tongue will corrupt your whole body and set the whole course of your life on fire. When James says the course of one's life, we might say the pattern of your life or the, the trajectory of your life. And once again, why is this such a big deal? Because when your tongue is not under the control of the Holy Spirit— then chances are the rest of your life is not either, which means you are still trying to have your own control and do things your own way, and life is all about me, 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 and I know what's best, and I'm going to figure it out on my own, and that leads to nothing but destruction and dissatisfaction in life. Verse 7. All kinds of animals, birds, Reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. This goes back to what I was talking about at the beginning of the message. You know, humans have tamed all kinds of animals, from killer whales to lions and tigers and bears, oh my... <laughs> But, but there is one thing that no human can tame on our own, and that is the tongue. Once again, this is why the tongue is a gauge for our overall spiritual condition. Because we need God, and we need the Holy Spirit to keep our communication in check. And when God has control of our lives, this is possible. But when we are still holding on to control, it's not. You know, if you leave today... And your takeaway is, you know what, Pastor Lane made some good points. I probably need to, to do a little bit better job biting my lip, 
at times and, and trying to keep my mouth shut or, or not posting that thing on Twitter or whatever. If, if that's what you leave with today, you miss the point. And, and you, you ultimately won't be successful because it's still all about me and my control and me doing a better job. The wisdom James is passing along to us is that I don't have the ability con to control my tongue on my own. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison, very intense imagery. And if this sounds a little over the top, it's not. That is what James is communicating. Yes, he is using strong language, but that is because he is making a strong point. I want you to imagine with me that sometime while you're away from your home, I get a, very, a, a few very poisonous snakes and I let them loose inside your home. And, and, and you don't know where they are. You don't know when will t one will try to come out and bite you. But you know they are there and you know the damage they could inflict. You know, that is what it is like to live with a tongue that is not under God's control. A restless evil full of deadly poison. Probably every single one of us here this morning could think back through our lives and maybe even just in this last week and remember a time when someone said something that, that hurt you so deeply. And to this day, you can still feel the pain of, of those words. A restless evil full of deadly poison. That is the power of of our tongue, the power of our communication. And we all have this power inside of us. And the only way to get control of it is to put God in control of it. Verse 9, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be Really, a better end of verse 10 is, my brothers and sisters, it cannot be this way. And now James is, is, is going to make his case for why this cannot be. Verse 11, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Once again, his point is that you can't be this way. With the same tongue, you can't praise God and curse men. And just as much as you can't get fresh water from, from a salt spring or, or figs from a grapevine. You know, when I first think about this, I might want to disagree. Be, because I've seen plenty of people who on Saturday are cursing the refs at a Husker game, and then Sunday morning they're singing praise to God. I have been guilty of this myself. But, but I think what James is saying is not that it's not physically possible to curse men and praise God, but when you do that, your praises are empty if they're coming from the same spirit that would curse men. If my mouth is cursing men, then my heart is not in line with God, and I am not under the control of the Holy Spirit, and my praises are empty they're, they're worthless. And I know that might sound harsh, but this is the same thing that James said back in chapter 1, verse 26. Chapter 1, verse 26, he said, Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and, and their religion is worthless. Now, now, if this stings a little bit, if your stomach feels a bit uneasy right now, I'm right there with you. Okay, I do not present this text as someone who's pure or perfect or has this all figured out. I am guilty of this as well. But what I can and should do is try to take something out of this. What can we learn from this for ourselves? All right, first of all, for some of you, your first step you may need to take may actually to be to go and seek forgiveness for the damage that your communication has done. You know, maybe you lashed out on someone with your words and you need to ask them to, to forgive you. Maybe you wrote something on Facebook or Twitter or an email or a text that you know you shouldn't have wrote. It was tearing someone down 
and, and you need to seek forgiveness, that would be a great first step. And, and unless you're willing to do that, chances are nothing's going to change. If your pride is at a level that you can't ask for forgiveness, then change will not take place. I know in my own life right now, regularly, I have to ask for my son's forgiveness <laughs> because I lash out on him when we're all tired and it's bedtime and it's not going well. <laughs> um, but I have to ask for forgiveness because that wasn't pointing him towards Christ. That wasn't edifying or uplifting what I did. Okay, and, and some of us, we, that's the first step. And then we all need to understand that James is not writing this to condemn us or to shame us, but to encourage us to give up control of our mouths, of our communication, of our lives to God. Giving control to God is the only way that we will be able to tame our tongues, to truly be successful in this area of life. And this is something that we have to decide to do daily, hourly, almost by the minute. Every single minute we decide, am I going to let God have control of this area or am I going to lash out and, and do things my own way? Only when I let God take control will I actually be able to effectively tame my tongue. And I want to make sure that you get this point right here at the end. And, and if you've been with us through James, you'll understand this. But this is not a matter of salvation. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But it is about living a redeemed life as a representative of Christ to the world around me. It is about the works, the fruit that follows salvation in our lives in order that we may be able to fulfill the great commission to make disciples and the great commandment to love God and love my neighbor. Okay, if I cannot humble myself and give God control of my tongue and my life, I will never be able to make disciples and I will never be able to truly love God and love my neighbor to the full extent that God desires for me to. If I can get very personal right here, if you're on Facebook, you may notice that I do not comment politically on Facebook. And part of the reason for that is because I have fallen in that area. And I've seen something that I knew was so false and so wrong, and I couldn't stand it, and I lashed out on that person's Facebook wall, and I ruined my testimony. I ruined my chance to reach that person for Christ. And which do you think was more important, getting my political point across or my testimony for Christ? And so I have just learned I cannot get into those discussions. It's not because I don't care. It's not because I don't have opinions and, and passions. But I just know that this tongue is a restless evil full of deadly poison. And when I'm on Facebook or Twitter, these fingers, <laughs> that's really still the tongue, can be a restless evil full of deadly poison. And I don't want that. I don't want that to ruin my testimony. And so I take this very seriously. And, and I'll still have face-to-face -face conversations with people, you know, because they can, they can sense my love and my perspective there in a way that they can't tell when I post something on Facebook. At least that's how I feel, and that's where I've been convicted in this area. And so I hope that we can all learn that it's not about biting my lip. It's not about doing a better job, keeping my mouth shut and just trying, don't say anything, Lane. Don't say anything, Lane. Don't say anything, Lane. It, no, it's about, God, you got to take control. <laughs> because if I'm in control, restless evil full of deadly poison. <laughs> if I'm in control, I'm going to lash out, and it's not going to be pretty. And so let's constantly, daily make that decision. God, you got to take control. I give you control in this area. Let's go to God in prayer. <clears throat> oh, Heavenly Father, God, thank you that you are a God of grace and mercy, a God of second and third and fourth chances, a God who um, sent your Son to die for us so that when we fall short, we, we know that Christ has already paid for our sin debt. 
Um, and we can still have that relationship with you. And we can still know that we have it can have eternal security in you and our eternity is in heaven and that's where our hope lies but dear god i do pray that you would um not condemn us god you don't want that but that you would convict us of, of areas of our life where we have not given you control where, where we have thought that i know what's best and i can do things my own way God, I pray that you would convict us and show us and, and that day by day we would learn to give you control of our tongue, of our communication, and really of every single area of our lives. God, thank you so much for, for this challenge from James. God, thank you for the opportunity to, to serve you, to be a part of your redemptive plan the opportunity to make disciples, the opportunity to grow in our love for you and our love for others. Dear God, what a blessing that is. And I just pray that you would help each and every one of us to do just that. It's in the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Let's worship together. Please stand. <laughs> As the deer panted for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. For, the, for, for that line, to you alone may my spirit yield. That's really what taming the tongue is all about, yielding our spirit to, to God. And so um, I want to close with Colossians 3, verses 15 through 17. It says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word 
with your mouth, your email, or indeed with your actions, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thank you so much for worshiping this morning. You're dismissed.